Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Daly, director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2011 Charles A. Lindbergh Memorial Lecture. The Lindbergh Lecture is an annual tradition here in May at the museum. Since 1982, the program has featured pioneers who represent the special qualities associated with Charles Lindbergh. Skill, determination, imagination, courage, and vision. Charles Lindbergh completed his history-making nonstop solo flight from New York to Paris on May 21, 1927. This evening's program is made possible by Bombardier. With, tonight, with us tonight is Mr. Guy Haché, President and Chief Operating Officer of Bombardier Aerospace. Guy, would you stand and be recognized please? It's important to note that none of these programs would be possible without sponsorship, so we're indebted to you for this, uh, our long-standing relationship for this lecture, and we really do appreciate it. The, uh, before we start the program, it's a tradition at the museum lectures to offer a brief update on current activities. On May 28th, we'll open a new exhibition, NASA Art, 50 Years of Exploration. The NASA art program was established in 1958 and includes works by many well-known artists, including Norman Rockwell, Andy Warhol, and Jamie White. At the uh, Udvarhazy Center, construction has come to an end. You may applaud on that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a major milestone for us, and it's, it's only taken 30 years to get that out there, but it's now completed and we're moving in. So the spaces will soon receive hundreds of aviation and space artifacts and millions of archival documents, photographs, sound recordings, film, and video items. You may have heard in the news that NASA will transfer Discovery, the longest serving orbiter in the space shuttle fleet, to the National Air and Space Museum. Yeah. <laughs> There's the curator from the space shuttle program here. <laughs> the, uh, now I've lost my place. The, um, well, when, when Discovery is moved here in about a year, the Space Shuttle Enterprise will be transferred to the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York. We've already begun planning the events for the arrival of Discovery at the Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center, and we'll invite the public to help welcome, welcome it. Uh, the, uh, and we're gonna do everything we can to make as much of this activity available to the public as possible. So we're really looking forward to, to having a lot of fun out there to see the transfer when it comes. When Discovery comes in on the, the shuttle transporter and then we shift it off and put Enterprise on to go back out, the, the entire operation will be, will be viewed, I hope, by as many of us as possible. The, uh, each year we go through an extensive process to identify an, a distinguished member of the aviation community to share his or her vision, memories, and insights. We are guided in this process by the museum's mission, which is to commemorate, educate, and inspire. And we're honored to welcome Admiral Edward L. Whitey Feitner as the 2011 Charles A. Lindbergh Lecturer. Admiral Feitner exemplifies the museum's guiding principles through a lifetime of achievement. He's a pilot of legendary proportions. To introduce our speakers, I usually provide a detailed list of achievements. But because Admiral Feitner will be relating the highlights of his long and memorable career, I'd like to leave as much time as possible for the discussion. I will just mention a few milestones to kind of set the stage. Admiral Feitner was born in 1919 in Lima, Ohio. He enrolled in the civilian pilot training program in 1939 and received his private license in 1940. To give you an idea of the challenges he faced early in his career, his first solo flight was in a Ford trimotor, and we'll talk about that later. He graduated from Finley College in 1941 and immediately enlisted in the Navy's B-5 Aviation Cadet Program. He graduated from flight training in 1942 and distinguished himself in World War II as a nine-victory ace who flew F-4F Wildcats and F-6F Hellcats. Following the war and after becoming one of the first graduates of the Navy's new test pilot school, he was assigned to the Naval Air Test Center where he flew the cantankerous F-7U Cutlass. Cantankerous was his word. <laughs> the uh, Admiral Feitner's next career move was to join the Navy's prestigious flight demonstration team, the Blue Angels, flying F-9F Panthers and Cougars, and then the F-7U Cutlass again. 
But all of the Admiral fight in his career challenge were not in the pilot seat. In his many command positions, he directed the design of aircraft such as the F-14 Tomcat and the Joint Strike Fighter, and implemented fundamental changes for naval aviation forces. Since his retirement from the Navy, Admiral Feitner has been president of FUS Incorporated, an aerospace consulting firm. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for Admiral Edward L., I'm not used to saying that, Whitey Feitner. I'm going to ask the questions, <laughs> and Whitey's going to tell the story. Can, it, can I put in one thing to begin with? Go ahead. <laughs> See, I won't do this very often, but, uh, but I do want to thank you for bringing up the Charles Lindbergh. Yeah, I had a great privilege. I, w I had a number of projects that were, were of interest to him. He came to Tax River and asked to be checked out, and uh, my boss, Mary and Carl, said, be my guest, take him out there. And so I gave him a check out in the in the F uh, Tiger Cat, twin engine, Grumman airplane. And this is one of the things I always remember about Charles Lindbergh. I gave him my 15 minute check out and said, okay, Colonel, I'll get in the fire bottle and we'll get you in the air. He said, uh, do you have a handbook? <laughs> <laughs> so I got him a handbook and I said, whenever you get ready to go, just raise your hand. That was at 10 o'clock in the morning at four in the afternoon, he was still out there reading the book. And, and at that time, he got up and walked in and talked to the chief of the hangar and then took the book home with him. Came back the next morning. So I, we finally got him airborne. He said, I'll be ready to go in about 20 minutes. Put him in the airplane. He went off. He was gone for two and a half hours. Came back. I said, I met him out to fly. I said, how'd it go, Colonel? He said, son, you've got a great airplane here. And with that, he walked off. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a hold of Mary and Carl and said, what in the world did he do out there? And he said, I don't know. He didn't tell me. So I got a hold of the crew chief, went out there. And the crew chief said, well, I don't know. He had me loosen the trim tab on the fourth tail of the uh, elevator. So we went out. Sure enough, he was flopping around. And all we could figure is he went out and did flutter tests there for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it might be interesting. <laughs> he came back later on. And he wanted to be checked out in the, in the Corsair carrying bombs. They were going, the Marines were going to take, uh, get into the bombing business, and they, they would carry four, uh, <coughs> four or five hundred pound bombs. And uh, but before we could do that, we, we we kept blowing the tires, and we had to pump up the pressure on it. And so I gave him all the details. He said, "Okay, give me four dummy bombs," and we we put them on there. He went out again. He was gone for, uh, oh maybe. 45 minutes, came back in and said, thank you very much. And with that, he went back and he, he went around all the Marine bases and taught them how to fly off with a heavy load off of coral runway and so forth. But he, he was an interesting character. Well, we appreciate those comments about Charles Lindbergh because he served the Lindbergh I, lecture. I, I didn't notice but that. But we yet. actually want to talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> we want to talk about Whitey tonight. All right. And how about now, uh, I've heard that your first solo flight was in a Ford TriMet. Could you explain how that happened? Yes. Uh, I, I, Ohio Oil is in Findlay, Ohio. And he decided he was going to build up the school. <coughs> they had a little college there that was a church-owned college. So he, he talked them into uh, the uh, Ohio Oil decided that they were going to hand out scholarships to all of the uh, uh, top m m members of, of all the little local schools around. And I came from a little town called Elida, Ohio. And so uh, they weren't kidding. They gave us a four-year prepaid scholarship to the, the school. They were serious. And uh, so when I, I reported in, I went uh, down and uh, checked in with the president of the college. And, you know, there were only 300 people in this college. And the he said, well, I think you ought to go down and thank Mr. Don Donnell for the, the great privilege you have of coming here with us. So I went down to see Mr. Donnell, and I got in his office, and we no more started talking, and the, the door opened, and uh, in came a, this aviator, look, and he looked like Charles Lindbergh. He had his helmet on, and ear flaps, and flapping, and 
you know, cut teeth and the whole bit. And he walked over and he talked to the president for a little bit. And, uh, and then he started out the door and he, he opened the door, turned around, looked at me and said, hey, kid, would you like to go fly? And, you know, I'm muttering around and the president said, go ahead. He said, I'll, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so off we go and we go out to the airport. And uh, he says, this is, this is Mike Murphy. He had the, he ran the airport and he was an old barnstormer and went around. Big handsome guy, you know, he looked a lot like, like a movie star. And any, anyhow, he, he got in the airplane. He says, oh, you can fly, get in the right hand seat. This is the two of them. He said, they've been working on this airplane and I want to go up and see if it's all right. So we take off and we go up and we fly around a little bit and he, he, he said, okay, it's all right, you fly. He said, go ahead, he won't hurt it. With that, he shoved the yoke forward and he had trimmed up, of course, and he came right up and settled down. And so for the next 15 minutes, he, he instructed me on how to fly a Ford Trimotor. And, and uh, so we go in and we get back there and just, he said, okay, I've got it. And he comes back to the field and he gets down and he runs the wheels on the ground, did a loop. He did this three times. <laughs> it's his airport, you know. So <laughs> take care. So I, anyhow, he got down. And I'm bubbling over. I said, "You know, this is just great." He said, "Well, if you like that, he said, come out any 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 day that you got time off." And you, we fly around. We got they had neon lights under this bird, and they'd fly around all over the eastern United States, flipping these uh, Ohio oil and and with the uh, neon lights, especially at night and. And, you know, it was around four or five hours. So, boy, two days later, I was out there in the airplane, and they, they got airborne. And the minute they got airborne, they said, okay, it's all yours. And they talked to me around where we were flying around there. And they came back and landed. And so I go back to school. And about two days later, I get a call. I'm in physics class. And, and the, they said, Mike Murphy wants to talk to you. And so I go out, and, and Mike said, Everybody's busy down here, and I've got to well, have to run over to uh, Indiana and uh, check on an airplane, and, uh, and I need a co-pilot. So he said, come on down. I said, Mike, Mike, I've got classes. He said, yeah, who's paying your, t your t t tuition down there? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's just enough for me. You know, I was looking for excuses. Anyway. Got down there, started to get in, and he said, no, no, you get in the pilot's seat. So I get in the pilot's seat. He coached me through the takeoff. And so we fly for three and a half hours, and we land at somewhere over in, in the Midwest there, a little Canute, Illinois, actually. And he, he said, if you'll stay with the airplane there for a little while, I've got to go in town and dicker about another airplane. And he said, uh, just keep all the people out. Don't let them damage the airplane. So about the, you know, after lunch, he, he was back out there, and he says, how does everything go? And I said, just fine. Nobody touched it. Didn't have any problem with it. He said, okay, um, incidentally, he said, uh, I got a little problem. Uh, I just bought an airplane here. Would you mind flying the Ford back to Finley? <laughs> you know, 18 years old. I said, why not? <laughs> you know, <laughs> other people do it. So I, <coughs> so with that, he goes and gets in his uh, airplane that he just bought. And he said, you take off and I'll join up on you. And, of course, I knew he was forced to go back. And I said, yeah, 083, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And so I get airborne, and the next thing I look out, and this huge biplane, it was bigger than the Ford Trimor, you know, it, and it comes up, of course, no radio, we have none at all. I look over, and there's Mike, and he says, <laughs> so we head off, you know, back to Finley, Ohio. So we another three hours, and we're back in the field, and I get there, and he, he moves up alongside me and says, <laughs> so, and believe me, anybody in this audience could fly that Ford Trimor. Oh, if, it, if it was trimmed up, you, you know, I don't care what you did. You, all you had to do was let go, and it, it straightened itself out, and you could start over again. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, this, this didn't, and you know, at 18 years old, who cares? You know, I, I, I had just flown, uh, flown up there, and I, I thought I was a real aviator. So I go in and land, and, you know, the thing lands by itself anyway. So we get down, and boy, he gets out of the airplane, and I said, boy, I'm bubbling over, and he said, Man, that was, that was really great. He said, yeah, oh, okay, but I want you out here at 8 o'clock in the morning. I said, he, he started saying, he said, yeah, I know you got class, but you be here at 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, that jerked me. He didn't say why, and so 8 o'clock in the morning, I was out there, and he was about standing by a Piper Cub, 
and he says, get in. <laughs> so he came in this type of step. And he said, now I w- I'm going to teach you to land this airplane. So he flew up and he made two landings, a quick thing. So he got out of the airplane and he said, and he, he had me fly it around each time. And he, and he, he would coach me through there landing on it. And after two landings, he got out and he said, okay, give me five more. Well, you know, Piper Seb, I'll tell you, it's a lot harder to fly than a speed than a <laughs> trimotor was. <laughs> but, you know, it bounces all over the world, here, as most of you in here know. I know a lot of your aviators. But anyhow, I managed to get it down five times, and he said, got out of the airplane, and he said, okay, now get this. You are now qualified, and yesterday never happened. Understand? <laughs> 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 you, you know, he, he was out to here. And say <laughs> But that's, that's, how, that's how I learned to solo an airplane. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to jump ahead a little bit here. And uh, following advanced flight training, you were sent directly to the fleet due to a shortage of uh, fighter pilots at the Defense Air Plan. And you have said that uh, Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare is the reason that you survived. So could you first expand on that and then secondly tell us about the passage known as the South Sea? Oh, had to. Uh, well, I... Of course, when I, I uh, when uh, the war started, you know, I, they, they were very good to me. I, you know, once I got to fly, and I, I was there every night that they let they let me fly. You know, school became secondary to me, and uh, and my and my number was coming up, and so I was just for the draft, and so anyhow, I was I took every opportunity, and we had all kinds of airplanes. I, you know, in the period that I w- would uh, be in the school and I finished flying. Uh, I had flown about 30 different airplanes, and I mean, th- these were all kinds of them. My, Mike would let me fly anything he had, uh, and we had we had a lot of people there, and of course, Ohio Oil was funding all of this. And so anyhow, and we, um, I'm going to digress just for a minute. Uh, what what this <laughs> what this, this flying was? They had a, a race a race at uh, Detroit, and a, a, a guy by the name of Pampana brought a a Bucher Jungmeister. This this is a a junior airplane that, uh, that they taught the Germans to fly. It looked like a big flight Piper Cub, and in fact, the airplane. Uh, and this one isn't isn't the ex- exact airplane, but the airplane that I flew is hanging out here. It looks like a Piper Cub. It's a bi bi biplane. It's got a checker tail on it. It's a little airplane. Uh, Mike Murphy bought this because at that era, a P-36 came in and landed behind the Germany by the name of Pampana who had this. And he couldn't see out, you know, when that airplane that he was in, and he chewed off the, the tail right up almost to the, to the back cock. <coughs> Mike Murphy bought that airplane, brought it back to Sibley, and Mike Murphy and a guy named Red Hall, who was a, he and I were co-captains of the wrestling team, and we, we were... We were in a flying program together and got out there. The three of us rebuilt that airplane from factory specs. Mike Murphy was a qualified A&E pilot. So he built the airplane, and bless his soul, he even trusted both Red Hall and myself to have a w- one flight in it. And then he said, okay, I'm going to go enter the aerobatics championship down at Miami. He put the airplane down there. And th- this is one phenomenal airplane, I'll tell you. It will fly in any direction. You can climb and dive it like this. You can tip it over. It, it, was, it was just a beautiful air, little airplane that the Germans used to teach flying. So he took that down to the Miami Air Races, and he won the aerobatic championship. And uh, he did this three years in a row. He retired the trophy. And my last year up there, we had this big, and it's, the trophy is now out in, in Oshkosh. And it, it stands about this high. And it's about this big around, solid silver. And you'll see him in the picture with it. They got it out, the, out there and it's on display. And that, that we, we used to polish that thing every day. That was one of our routines. And we kept it in the hangar just all the time I was there. But uh, that's, that's how we got introduced to flying. Well, how did you get introduced to combat with uh, Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare? Okay. So... Along about this time, you know, I'm happy as a clam. I'm flying. Mike let us fly. We could fly passengers. We didn't get paid for it, but we got flight time. 
And we could fly any one of the about 30 airplanes that we had there. And, and so, you know, we were having a great ball time. And, and then, <coughs> of all things, the school burned down one night. And uh, so, and this was about the time that uh, I was to get, getting ready to go to uh, be inducted into the Army. And, uh, and so we had already signed up to, if we got called, we were going to go into the, to the Army Air Corps. And Mike came to me one day and he said, hey, take that, take that airplane out there. We had a beautiful little high-wing monoplane. Um, and he said, uh, take that airplane up there and find out what this Navy stuff's all about. So we go up to Detroit, Michigan, which is, you know, about 30 minutes away. And we land up there and, oh, they gave us the royal treatment, told us what we wanted. We wanted uh, some information on, on their uh, Navy's uh, program and so he did it and he said well, while we're getting this together why don't you watch this film and this was Hell's Angels <laughs> I don't know whether any of you have ever seen Hell's Angels this is a great movie and so we're sitting in there enjoying this and finally they come in they click it off and they said well that's a little description of the Navy flight time and here's your package and incidentally uh, you ever thought of joining the Navy and I said no we're, but we're signed up to join the Army Air Corps and he said yeah but don't you have to wait a little bit and I said yeah five months he said, we'll take you today. <laughs> well, that <laughs> didn't ring any bells with me. And I said, well, thank you. And, and Red took it in and said, hey, did you hear what he just said? He said, we're liable to get drafted before this. So he <laughs> said, I'm going to sign up. Well, it took him about 10 minutes to convince me until we both signed up. They said, okay, you're now in the Navy. They accept that you can go back. We had two weeks to go to graduation. They said, go back and graduate. And the day you graduate, come on back up. So that's what happened. They graduated. That day, uh, Red's uncle had a Piper Cub, and we took our dad for a spin around the, the field for a little bit, and they went in to say goodbye to Mike Murphy, and, and, he, uh, and he, my dad was with me, and he said, I said, well, we got to get going. We got to get up there. And he said, oh, don't worry about that. Take that Stinks and Reliant out there and take that up there, and I'll, I'll come up and pick it up tomorrow. So, boy, we leaped in, if you know, with a black airplane and big red stripes are all around, a high-wing monoplane, beautiful thing. And uh, we had that polish. And so I got up there and landed Gross Hill and, and uh, all these, ar these uh, guys in khaki uniforms came out there and they helped us tie the airplane down. And then they found out who we were and what we were there for. And, boy, they had us standing at attention. We marched off. <laughs> and that was... When they found out the amount of much flight time we had, this was they started this uh, CPC program at that time. And uh, hey, Wendy, we got to get you out of Ohio. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my problems. Can, yeah, can <laughs> we maybe could uh, let's assume you've graduated from flight school in okay. the Navy, <laughs> and now you've been assigned to the fleet as a fleet pilot, and uh, you're going to start your your uh, combat, and under the tutelage of Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare. So. What what happened was that uh, we got to, uh, we were waiting to go to go and we had uh, before our numbers came up and so Bush O'Hare, uh, we I, we got orders to go to the to the out to the uh, the the carrier that was in that was damaged and uh, th this was uh, was the was going to be our eventual goal and because. Red and I had, had had more flight time than anybody else. Uh, we got orders directly out to the Pacific. Uh, and so they put us in a, in a, on the train, sent us out to the West Coast. We checked in for transportation. And uh, the, <laughs> the transportation officer there, he had problems. He had a destroyer, an old USS Henderson sitting out there with 450 Army troops on there. And he had no officers for the ship. He had an old a Mustang that was the lieutenant commander who was the skipper, but he had no officers. He grabbed us, marched over, and he said, hey, we we got to go out here. They're going to send us off to war. He said, yeah, but I've got you. <laughs> <laughs> so he put us on this ship, and uh, this old Mustang looked at me, and he said, okay, fighting it. You're, you're the executive officer, and as far as you're the first lieutenant, and your main job on here is to feed all of these soldiers on here for, while we take them out to, the, out to Pearl Harbor. 
Well, we didn't know the first thing, you know. So uh, I was smart. At least I was smart enough. I got a hold of the colonel, and I said, <laughs> "Okay, let's work this out." Well, the numbers and and the feeding spaces we had on there ended up. We fed around the clock, and and everybody got two meals every 24 hours. And so when we headed off to take these guys out to Pearl, <coughs> two days out of San Francisco, and the general quarters down. Well, I'm. I mean, I'm in charge, so I get everybody out there, light them up on the sides, and we get them into their 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 vest, and uh, and we're standing there watching, and these two little bees, bees that were escorting us, are out there, and they're flipping double uh, dip charges. You know, they have a Y gun, and they go out and fire, and and all at once, we're standing there right in front of us, about it's a little less than five yards, right on the port beam. All of a sudden, there was this big rumble, and the ship shook, and the, and this water boiled up. And so help me, out of this thing came this black submarine. It came out almost up to, came out in the island, came out, and there was this big red beat ball looking right at us. And it was just about a 1,000 yards off our port beam. We were just getting ready to fire that torpedo when they, when they, when they got to the, the depth charges. Well... We watched this submarine. They'd get filled with water. And go, 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 go. And, uh, so the next thing, <laughs> the old Mustang came out and said, listen, nobody knows we're here. I don't want one word. Don't any of you write anything. Don't anybody get on the radio. They, this, this, they'll replace that thing. They don't know it's gone. And with that, we headed on out to Pearl. Well, right about the time that submarine was after us is about the time that the Battle of Midway took place. We, we should have been there on the Yorktown. And so we got out to Pearl, and of course the Yorktown is now sunk, and uh, so you're, you're familiar with that battle, I know. And so they didn't know what to do with us, so they sent us down to a little island called Maui. It's a sugar plantation that was owned by this Freckles Corporation, and they, it's a big wealthy family, and they raised cane sugar there. So I get down there, and that's where I meet Butch O'Hare. And uh, he has just been, he, he was a Lieutenant J.G., and then the Coral Sea was sunk down in the uh, early part of the war, and the Coral Sea uh, <coughs> uh, Butch was airborne, and he didn't have a full tank of fuel. And so the air, other airplanes went off, and lo and behold, the Japanese came in with one flight, and everybody was off chasing them. And here came nine more airplanes, and they were right on the horizon. Butch is in the air. He's got about a third of a tank of fuel, and he's all by himself. And these nine airplanes with the leader of the squadron, of the Japanese squadron, is coming in all lined up. Butch O'Hare started in. He, 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 great, great. You know, he didn't have enough ammo to do this. He shut off everything but two guns. And this, this guy went in there, and he shot down six of those airplanes from the time they appeared on the horizon before they got up to where they could drop their bombs. The, uh, the last two airplanes panicked. They dropped their bombs and left. But Butch was out of ammo and he couldn't chase them. So that he got the Medal of Honor as a result of that. So, and uh, and that's that's how, how desperate that war was at that time. So uh, so I'm I'm sitting there at Maui, and the USS Enterprise comes out, and it's got a brand new squadron on there, and They've heard about the, uh, the, the, the fast weave was invented by Butch O'Hare, but he was a he was a junior officer, and so uh, one of the, the big squadron com uh, group commanders, um, the name of Jimmy Fats, said, "Demonstrate this to me." We used to fly three plane formation fighters. He came up with a scheme where we had the call the fluid four. And we now flew four airplanes, and they two and two, and you separated the the, the list so you could you could cover each other, other whenever the anybody attacked the squadron. And you must remember, at this time of the war, we were always outnumbered every time we took off. Well, this was such a great idea, and Jimmy Fats recognized it for what it was, and so the Navy adopted this as their and so as what was going to happen. But anyhow, two people came down from Fort Island. And they wanted to see a demonstration of this. So Bush was going to take them out. And there's Stan Lulo, one of the survivors from the other. Stan didn't show up. And Bush 
turned to me, and he didn't know me from Adam, but he said, Feitner, come over here. And he said, do you remember the sa- how we did the fast food? We've got to demonstrate it for these people. So we went up, and we all had loads of ammo, but we went up, and, and we demonstrated the fast food to them. And boy, this, and this, the one guy who was really all eyes was, uh, was the squadron skipper, and he said, that's for us. And so we, they came down and, and Bush said just before they left, he said, well, we, uh, he had a, each one of us make four runs on the uh, tar- his towed target at 15,000. And we came back, and well, this is all over. Well, the minute they were gone, he called and said, Feitner, get over here. And he said, over there. He had counted all, all of the holes in this thing, and he's a very proud guy. Uh, he was a good, good shot, of course. This banner's got about 70 or 80 holes in it. There were two red holes and the rest were blue. I had the blue. <laughs> uh, well, you you had to know you had to know him to, to know that he was a very proud man. And he, and he said, "Sit down. Who the hell are you anyway?" And he, for the next two hours, he 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 knew everything that I had done since I I was crawling around on the floor. I tell you, he he was a very thorough individual. He's a very smart man. But so anyhow, he got to know me, and of course. It turned out that he hel- he only had about 2,000 more, I mean, about uh, 250 hours more than I had. And, of course, I w- his was with all Navy planes and mine were a lot of air- civilian airplanes. But anyhow, from then on, I could do no wrong with Butch O'Hare. You know, I became his, his little brother, and that's the way we <laughs> – for the next two months, uh, I had a ball out there. <laughs> and then then VF-10 came along on the Enterprise, and they were going out – they were going to the war. And uh, the, the the battle of Coral Sea was just uh, was was just over, and now the Japanese were on Guadalcanal, and things were getting very tough out there. Well, the night before the squadron was to go, they had a mid-air collision, and so Jimmy Flatley came over to Bush O'Hare and said, "Listen, I need two pilots right here and now, as we're leaving tomorrow." And so Gordon Barnes and myself were sent over to the VF-10 on the Enterprise. And we did a little midnight requisition of the, one of the pilots in the squadron was John Leplin. He was from my hometown. And so he got in and he said, why don't you come on? We're going to the mission. And turned out we were short on uh, gun sites for the, and remember, we're flying F4Fs at this time and F4F3s. And so we were, we, were, we were going off to war and we had planes that didn't have gun sites in them. So Leplin, Leplin got a hold of me, and we, we get a, about four enlisted troops in there. We get a pickup. We go out, and all of the airplanes are locked in a locked-up uh, area over there. He's, he walks up to the guard. He's got a, a you know, a Garand rifle on him. And he said, son, hand me your rifle, and then you go and sit down over there. We got a little business we got to take care of. And <laughs> with that, <laughs> he, he blows the, the lock apart, and we go in there, and the, and the crew he brought with him, they took all the all the gun sights out of about four airplanes out of there. We got as many as they needed, threw them in the truck. We got out there. He p- picked up the rifle. And he walked down about 40 yards and laid it down. He said, now, son, we're going to leave, and your gun's down there, and you can have it back after we disappear. You understand? And he said, I'm going to be watching you, and we took off in this truck. Well, we were leaving the next morning, so... You had to know John Leplin. He, he was a maintenance officer, and we had what we needed. Next day, we shoved off. We never heard a word about it. <laughs> so that's how we got enough of these. Uh, well, in, in the next two days, we had to we had to qualify these uh, things. And I, I, myself, and Gordon Barnes flew three airplanes apiece onto the ship because the other people weren't tarqualed yet. So on the way to war, we, we did tarqualls the next day to give everybody at least – uh, five landings on board in the, the weather we had, and then we we headed on down. and And the next thing we got down there, we had the Battle of Santa Cruz, and we had the Zui Kaku and the Show Kaku were down there, and uh, it got very interesting. Uh, they shoved, they would come in as if they were going to Guad- Guadalcanal was the prize, and of course they were going to come in and, and take it back. They thought they thought, and we. Uh, we now have one carrier in the Pacific, or we had two at that. I'm sorry, we had still had two. We had Hornet, 
and enterprise. Identical sister ships. But so we were, we, got, we were together down uh, just uh, east of Guadalcanal. And uh, sure enough, there was a Dewey Cockle to show Cockle showed up at night. So the next morning at daylight, uh, we all took off and, and we got airborne. We had no more than gotten airborne and the Japs had gotten up a couple hours ahead of us because they were overhead. And the next thing I know, they were all over us coming down. And uh, they shot down John Lepsa um, and uh, his, his, his two of his wigs, uh, I mean, one, one of them and one the other one. And then one, one guy got away, but he came, got away with about 170 holes. I was flying over in the starboard side of the formation of Jimmy Flatley, and none of them got over that far. So the Japanese got up early, and they'd come over, and they, they saw us coming in. We, were, we hadn't even charged the guns yet, and we were up at about 12,000 feet climbing. And that's when they hit us, and they took out seven airplanes in the first pass. Those guys were good back in those days, you know. These are guys that had, you know, probably four or five years of fighter pilots. They were really experienced, and they were good. And so, so that, that, that wiped out one whole division. John Leppler was killed there, and, and the other two, uh, Chip Redding and, and Chase, both, both those guys were captured and became prisoners for the rest of the war. But uh, we were on, they hit the Jap fleet, and they came back to the Enterprise, and uh, they'd already sunk the Hornet, and it was leaning over and it was burning. And first thing I saw was a ship. <laughs> I thought I thought it was everybody. They were identical ships, and it, of course, it turned out that it was a uh, Yorktown, and it it sank. So then we had to combine what was left of two air wings and put them on there. And and believe me, there we only had about left out of the the, the seventy pilots we started out with. I think we had about forty five left. We lost a lot of people that day. Some of them ran out through the war, of course. But we we piled them all on top of the the Enterprise, and and I remember we, we had too many airplanes, and th there was no island that we could go to till we got get over toward Guadalcanal, and so they they hit the the ship pretty badly, and uh, one of them uh, the guy came in and they, they shot him down, but he he was diving, he went through the number one elevator, uh, just short of the number one elevator, his bomb blew the elevator, and we have pictures of the number one elevator in about. 100 feet in the air out there, and of course, where his bomb went out, went in down there, it blew up, and that wiped out Boys Town where I lived. You know, all the jails were up forward, wiped them out completely. And uh, anyhow, they they shot the, uh, a couple more airplanes down. And I remember when I got back to the ship, <coughs> it was zigzagging. They were, they were under a torpedo attack, and uh, we we got as many people as we could get aboard. And, that's how we started the war out there. That was did you get a shot during any of that stuff? Did uh, uh, yeah, I, I when I did you get your first kill? Got my first kill. I got. I just got back there, and they they said, "Okay, the, the, the ready room's gone." But they said, "Get grab an airplane, and uh, we got to get you airborne. We don't have enough room to stack people on deck." And uh, you you and and one other pilot he said, "Get airborne." Well. He got airborne, but we'd already had spare airplanes up in the overhead, and, and they were had Cosmoline on all the guns. They didn't have time to clean the guns. We got out when the, we got to 10,000 feet. His guns were were frozen, but I uh, intercepted the last of the bombers coming in, and uh, <coughs> about you know about eight of these guys going, and only two of them were left. And so I, I went in there and I I shot one down and the. Uh, the uh, about the guy flying on my wing, his his guns. He had had one of the airplanes in the overhead, and the Cosmoline was still on. His guns were jammed, so I was out there by myself, and he was with me. So we we got the the number nine guy who was diving, and I shot him, and he exploded and went down there. And so then we we started back to the Enterprise, and as we came around the cloud, came two zeros, and they did they did the normal thing. They were in front of us, so I started diving at them. They did the very thing you, you, we would have been warned against. They, they pulled up in a turn. They could make a tighter turn than we did. And the thing was, don't ever follow them. Butch O'Hare saved my life that day. I knew better than to follow them because at about the second loop, they were around behind you. They pull that much tighter loop. So uh, 
I did exactly what Butcher told me. And these guys did, we came around this cloud there, there they were. So we started in on them, they pulled up in their loop. I did a hard right turn to the right. He's coming around and they came right down, right in front of me. <laughs> you know, I got my first kill right there. <laughs> and, and with that, the, the other guy, I tried to catch him and he took off, he was gone. And, but, but it turned out my wingman, uh, one of the, who later was one of the Blue Angels, his guns were, they pulled it out of the overhead and hadn't taken the cosmoline out. They were frozen. He didn't get off one one round even because it was cold up there and the guns just jammed. So anyhow, that was the, that was my first kill. The, uh, do we want to go to the Panama Canal at this point? Oh, or yeah. Or do you want to stay with us? Uh, no, no. That's, that's hey, let me just ask, did, did you have very good eyesight? Yeah, I, I had very good eyesight. Yeah. See, I can, one of the, we're hearing some characteristics that are, uh, I think, uni uh, unique to, to aces. They all have good eyesight, hmm. they're good shooters, and they have great flying skills. And that uh, when it <laughs> comes out to where they, yeah, and, and you have, it takes all of those three to, uh, to be the first yeah. one to see him and then be able to get him when you do see him. That, that's right, and we had this problem of uh, the guns Back in those days, you had to get all the cosmoline out, or the guns froze yeah. on you. So this, this, so we learned that lesson. That this was, a, but, but a lot of people just couldn't see airplanes, and I was one of those lucky guys who I, c I could see airplanes when nobody else did, and uh, th this paid off the, uh, in there because we were always outnumbered every time we took off. <laughs> you, you were outnumbered and and flying inferior equipment. And, uh, yeah, and they they could out turn they could out turn yeah. us. We could not turn with them. And you and they were not the airplanes that you did have weren't fully equipped for uh, they and all the things that we talk about bore sighting and all these were they, they didn't have a, they didn't have a gun sight that worked. No. The gun sight was useless and we used a fixed thing. But I fortunately I had run into into uh, Bush here over there and uh, and his theory was you get into where you can't miss. Yeah. <laughs> and that, so that's a, that was our, and we had a pretty agile airplane in that uh, uh, bi-winged airplane we were flying, F F three F, and uh, so we got out there and the and the, the zeros, they came apart pretty easily. Fifty calibers just annihilated those things, but we we had such a limited amount of ammo. If you held on the trigger, you had a minute and a half of fuel. I mean of ammo, and so we. we Butch, uh, he had pounded this into me till it, it was a religion. He said, you don't ever fire more than one second burst at a time, and you don't fire until they fill up your whole windshield. <laughs> you, you can't miss. And we, we, we don't have enough ammo to get, get all these guys. So that's exactly what I did for the, for the first time I ran into these guys. I, <coughs> I was ready, and later on I got sophisticated. I, I'd only use two, because these were 50 calibers. And they just annihilated Japanese airplanes. So they were, you, were you flying? Now you're still on the Enterprise flying F four F. F four F on the Enterprise. Okay, and then um, should we go to the Panama Canal quickly for this? Yes. That you had a an interesting passage through the Panama. But that was on the Bunker Hill. That was on the Bunker Hill. And this is second neck and you second cruise. And you're transitioning now to Hellcats. Is that what you're? That's F6? right. We now okay. we now have Hellcats on it. Okay. And we're going out again, and this is a. <coughs> and so, you know, the we knew from experience that they they could out outturn a Hellcat. So we had to devise some tactic where we could uh, get the best of them. And of course, we had 50 caliber guns, and they they only had 7.7. And so, uh, but the 7.7 could still make a lot of holes in your airplane. You know, this was, but uh, we had we had a tactic, of course, where we we would uh, we would separate from going on them. So that they could, because their their principal maneuver was they'd do a loop, and about the third loop they were behind you, because they could pull a tighter loop than we could. But how about the Panama Canal? But uh, <laughs> so then we got down to the to the Panama Canal, and uh, we had uh, I think we had uh, two carriers that were down there with us at that point, and we. we we started through, we were going to go through the Panama Canal, but before we could go through, uh, there were some other airplane, uh, other ships out there that were giving us a bad time. And so 
we made several attacks on those things, and uh, this is where we learned it. Uh, it uh, the, the gun sight we had to, was lacking, and we had to move right in on, on these things because we didn't have enough ammo to do anything else. We had to wait till we got in there. Well, if you held a stick, a stick down, we had 14 seconds of ammo, and so we had to save the ammo for every chance we got. Uh, so this, when we we would uh, strafe all of these these ships, and uh, if you were lucky and hit a magazine, well, that that took care of the, the, the ships at that time. These 50 calibers made a lot of holes. We need to get to the point, please. Okay. The um, I think you know. Did Charlie and me ever talk about the rescue mission in the Navy Dark? Yes. Well, in the we need to set the stage a little bit on this one. Yes, we okay. do. Uh, you know, we're down in, in uh, Lady Gulf, and uh, we we got the the whole fleet is down there. We were sort of, and we came in. Uh, I think uh, we were, we were on Enterprise at that time, and uh, the uh, the Japanese had two carriers, Dewey Costume and Sarah Proxy, and so we put together a. Uh, a strike, uh, which is the fighters would go in first, and we'd try to keep all the AAA down before the, the bombers would come in after us. And uh, that's the tactic we used from then on. And uh, But the, those 50 calibers did a real number on a lot of things right there. And uh, so it's, it, our problem was it didn't last long enough. It would, we just weren't carrying enough, enough ammo in the airplanes. And so this, uh, even though they they had us outnumbered by airplanes whenever they had airplanes around, and they were very very they could outturn us, so we had to be very careful and we didn't waste the ammo on them, so we had a lot of, we we never chased them in a, in a dogfight because after about the third turn they would be around behind you. That was even in the wild. I mean in the Hellcat. <laughs> that was even in the Hellcat. Okay. That was in the uh, now there's a down pilot somewhere out there in the Lady Gulf, right? Yes. And we needed to get him. Yes. Okay. And you had to put the mission together for them. I did. Okay. And, uh, and so we we got a pilot down out there, and we we send this group of, of four of us out there to to, to pick him up, and uh, we've got a a float plane that's going to sit down and pick him up, and uh, we've got to protect him on the way back. Well, we get out there, and and uh, no no more than we get there, we've got him down there. The, uh, the the pilot is about to be strafed by these people. So we, we got out, we ran these off. We had an OS, OSCU pilot uh, with us. And so he lands in the water, and he's proceeding to pick pick the pilot up. And this, this pilot had been, he, he was being shot at by these, these officers that were coming in. And each time they would get him, and so he kept throwing off his clothes, and he had nothing left but his life jacket on. And when they would come in, he'd dive down in the water, and be under there, and they weren't smart enough to, to separate. They both came in at once on him. So uh, he'd come up and he was getting there. Well, we caught there about, he, he told me this was about his fourth time that he had been there, and he was trying to get him out of ammo. But uh, anyhow, we, we ran the planes off till, till we got back there, and, and by that time, he was totally exhausted, but the, the OSCU landed, and the kid was too, too tired to get, he was just hanging onto the wing. And this young JG was in the S uh, SO3, gets out of the airplane, leaves it idling, and he's go going through the water, gets down there, he picks the pilot up bodily, gets him up, and he raffles him into the back seat somehow. And the next thing he, he does, he, he gets airborne, and uh, that we had chased all the airplanes away, and, and that's how we saved his life. He got back to the deck of the ship. And, and what was the range that you flew on? It was a pretty extended mission, I guess, right? Didn't you have to go out quite a bit? So you're min fuel at this time? Yes. We trying to get him back? We had, to, in order to get him back, we, we barely had fuel enough to get him back on board. And uh, so they, but we did manage to get that. So we saved him, that, that particular pilot anyway. But we, we were, that's how short we were all this time. But, you know, we, we were outnumbered by the number of airplanes they had. And also, uh, they had, we had, we didn't have a big load of ammo. We only had 14 seconds of fuel. We had all six guns, so I, I just from there on I knew 50 calibers would shoot down any any zero that was in the air, and I, I shut off four guns. We used two, and they were emptying and three more and two more. 
Right. That's and, how we and, survived. And you got nine killed. I guess, and yeah. were uh, all the, was the first one in a Hellcat? And then the rest of them were no, the Wildcat? No, first one was in the Wildcat. And then the eight first, in the First in the three Hellcat? were in the Wildcat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and then the Hellcat, of course, we had a big advantage. We had six guns with lots of ammo in them. And, uh, and uh, we, we had one guy who actually shot down seven airplanes with one ammo load by using two guns at a time until he could get, because back in those days, uh, we didn't try to maneuver with them. We just had enough airplanes. We outnumbered them. We'd box them in and win them with one little spurt. And 50 calibers really did a number on all of zero. A zero just came apart. One burst, good burst from 50 calibers, and they exploded. They, they were, if the airplane was stressed and they were trying to move, you could just see when the bullets could cut something and those zeros just came unzipped. Right? Their wings came off, their tail would come off. They just had well, you had six fifties, but you didn't. You only used two at a time. Two at a time, because that's all you needed. Yeah. Well, well, if if you if there were six guns, if you pulled them all at the same time, you had fourteen seconds of ammo, and you were out of business. Okay. <laughs> so, and we found out that two, two of them would do the job, and uh, but you just you saved them until you were in and you couldn't miss. You know, it was either ram them or shoot them. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but. But the point is, you have to be a pretty good shooter when, when you're only using oh, yeah. two. You got to be really. You, you can't. You can't yeah. afford to. And you know, this is one of the things I was lucky enough to run into Butch O'Hare. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you though, uh, you won the war, right? And came home, right? And went through the first test pilot course down at Pass River. That's we're, correct. We're we're running out. I we need I need to get to the cut list. Okay. So. Um, and this is where you were introduced to the F-7U Cutlass. That's correct. Your favorite airplane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Cutlass was a pretty good airplane along about that stage, as you all, all, all remember. And, uh, of course, we had a lot of it experience with it. But it was also uh, a pretty vulnerable airplane. But anyhow, we had 50 calibers on that thing, and it was a pretty maneuverable machine. And uh, but we had, to, we had to fly it so that... You didn't waste the ammo, <laughs> you know. We d we didn't have that much ammo there, and but boy, that, that was a big difference when we got into to flying uh, the cutlasses out there. It, made, it was better than the zero as long as it didn't have to maneuver too much. How many dead stick landings have you made in a cutlass? <laughs> I I hate to admit this, but four times. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you were flying the cutlass also when you were a Blue Angel. Yes, did that's right. Did you ever finish an air show with both engines still running? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> did your wingman ever finish? <laughs> yes. He, uh, one time he finished because his, his guns were jammed. <laughs> he, <laughs> didn't, he didn't get off around. <laughs> but the, the, uh, those 50 calibers really did a number on those zeros. <laughs> and you, you had to, but you, you had to save the ammo. And so I had learned earlier, we, didn't have, we only had 250 rounds. You held the trigger down, you had 11 seconds. Right. I, I just shut off four of them all the time and I used two and then would use the other two and then then the other two on the thing. But uh, there was a time when you were a courier and you were taking some information to Europe and you, you hopped a ride on a C-124 and it was gonna go land at the Azores. Yeah. And all of you had a pre-flight meal before you left. That's right. And, but you didn't like what they were having. It was some kind of goulash you didn't they want. They had goulash, and I cannot even stand the smell okay, of it. Okay, so you take <laughs> off now, and you've no, been flying. No, they fixed me. Uh, they yeah, I know, they but you didn't eat what they ate, though. No, okay. I didn't eat any. And now you took off, and you're flying for six hours or something like that. Right. Then what happened? Then, and so we, we're, we're out in the middle of nowhere out there, of course, and uh, we, we got these, uh, these airplanes are, are, uh, Let's see, that was in the Battle of... No, no, this, we're, we're flying to the Azores. Okay. And this oh, air, yes. The Air Force crew on this 124. The 124, if you're not familiar, is a gigantic, they call it the aluminum overcast, very big airplane. Uh, you sit about 25 feet up uh, above the ground when you're in the pilot seat. That's right. And Whitey was hooking a ride. He had a briefcase handcuffed to his wrist, and, uh, and the crew who all ate this goulash now are becoming, have food poisoning. Yes. Everybody's dying on the airplane, mm. except you. They, they're all out of commission, and, you know, they were really sick. <laughs> so I, I was left with the airplane and, and these people, and so that, that turned out to be a real fiasco because 
<laughs> As you can well imagine, yeah, I was the only one that was able to do anything at this point. And uh, that's what... So you flew it to the Azores. The weather was lousy. It and was. So you're going to make an actual DCA in an airplane you've never been in. Mm -hmm. and, and it's about a four-man crew and you're by yourself. Yes, that's correct. And uh, But we managed to get this... Uh, Got to break out the radar. It got on the radar, and uh, we did manage to get in there and uh, and then land the board without any great great strain at that point. <laughs> it's a little bit of an oversimplification. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's amazing. I mean, the, the the things that Whitey is describing here are just incredible feats of airmanship. So, uh, it, but but we have more to talk about. Yes. Okay, uh, you get back from that, and now you, uh, you're the officer in charge of the Jet Transition Training Unit for taking the Navy from props to jets. That's correct. Uh, they, they had a group out in, uh, in, in Olathe, Kansas, and uh, our, our job was to take as many pilots as we could and, and ship them over uh, to, to give them jet aviation experience. So they would send a, a number of pilots out there, and it was our job to... to get these guys qualified jets and they can go back to their squadrons and then transfer their squadrons into it. So this is called, uh, this is the, the jet transition training course that out of Olathe, Kansas. So for each squadron would send a couple of their ace pilots out to us and then we taught them to fly jets uh, out of Olathe, Kansas. And of course, if you've ever been to Olathe, Kansas, the weather is never good out there. It's, <laughs> it's either raining or it's a, yeah, we've got violent thunderstorms or uh, or terrible winds. You know, it's a it's a tough place to have a transitional training course. But but we did, and the squadrons would send people uh, two at a time out there, and they go back and then teach their own squadron. So this was called a jet transitional training course, and uh, we ran this for about a year and a half, getting everybody switched over from props over to jets. The um <coughs> The role that you played in setting the future for Navy aviation, or naval aviation, in terms of fighter aircraft, uh, you uh, chaired four fighter studies that I'm well aware of. And yes. the, uh, uh, would you want to talk any about that? Or some yeah, of the I, I ended up being the, the with the, of course, I'd been through uh, the Protection River uh, training course there, but uh, I ended up in the fleet and uh, had the jet transitional training course in which we we changed pilots from props over how to fly jet airplanes. And we had a pretty hand-picked crowd of people out there as instructors. And uh, so people would send their, their uh, a certain number. Every squadron got a certain number of pilots a day would come here, and then they would go back to the squadron and train their squadron to fly jets. And that was the purpose of the operational flight training course out of Jan Chief. How about some of the considerations in terms of uh, what were you looking for in a, in a follow-on fighter when that led to the F-14? What, what were the We, we did the a fighter, fighter study and yeah. we, we uh, determined what the airplane had to be in order to, to hold our own when it came to the war out there. And as a result of those uh, fighter studies, we, we pretty well designated what the air, next airplane should look like. And we knew we had to have at least 50 caliber guns in all of them. And we had to have some ammo in them. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, the airplane was, uh, the Hellcat came along, and it pretty well uh, fit into that category. And that's what we did for this. We, we got it so they had a, a decent uh, load on there. And they, if you conserved your ammo, you could shoot down at least, at least six airplanes anyhow. And a lot of people would, we had six guns on there, and they shut down the outer two. And they'd shoot everybody with the, the four inboard guns, and the two out there would take you home again. Yeah, you can see that a major consideration of a fighter pilot is don't run out of ammo. Yeah, that's okay. correct. Okay. <laughs> when you run out of ammo, you're out of you're out yeah. of choices. <laughs> the uh, we've we've kind of gone through the uh, what we had planned to talk about. Is there anything else that you'd like to, or or should we maybe take some questions and let the we probably podcast? should take some questions. Over. Okay, anybody have anything they'd like to ask? Uh, Yes, go ahead. Oh yeah, th this uh, these are the uh, four of the frontline fighters, and there were only sixty-six of us ever flew all of these 
four airplanes. We call, we had the four seas club. We called it. You know, it's the Cutlass, the Crusader, the Crusader two, and the and the. Uh, yeah, the Corsair, which was the only prop, and the rest of them were all the jets. They, they were Cutlass, Cutlass, and, and Crusader. Crusader one, Crusader two. Yeah. All chance bought airplanes. All chance bought airplanes, and uh, the chance bought donated this jacket to, to, uh, to all of us who had done that. We only had sixty six people who had flown all those, so this was kind of a special club. And there's probably not many of them still around, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> there are not very many of these around. I, I think we had about uh, about 36 of us at one time that had flown all of these. But that club didn't last too long. We all grew, got older. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> Any other? Yes. Go ahead. Did you fly the F-8 Crusader? Yes, I did. Uh, but uh, that was a, I was a, an air wing commander at that time, and uh, and the first Crusaders were, uh, you know, they they left a little to be desired. They they were great airplanes, a lot of performance, but uh, they they didn't have enough ammo for one thing. <laughs> 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 there were a lot more airplanes than we had ammo for them. So, <laughs> and they. <laughs> yeah, Whitey's ideal design is a gigantic ammo. Magazine. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes. How'd you get your name, Whitey? Oh, that was easy. I was I was out in the Hawaiian Islands, and uh, and uh, Butch O'Hare was out there, and he he had everybody. We had to all go out there and and fly in the hot sun and so forth, and. You know, I got sunburned like mad. Uh, you know, blonde hair, and you know, <laughs> and so anyhow, he he nicknamed me Whitey as a result of that, because I was always I, everybody else had a suntan, and I was white as a sheet. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't tan. You know, blonde people don't. Most of us got got burned instead of, of tanning, and that's where I got the name Whitey. Everybody thought it was my hair. It had nothing to do with it. I had white hair anyhow. <laughs> What was your first memory of your interest in aviation when you were a young man? My dad had a friend who was a, had, had a, a, one of the early biplanes, and he lived uh, just, he, he had grown up with my dad, and he, 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 he was trying to set up a barn for him and things, and he wanted a little money for it, and so the, my dad and I went over there, and we dickered around with him, and my dad gave him some money, and he gave me some flight lessons. <laughs> and so that that's where I, that's where I really got into got into flying and boy I to tell you I found out that was a world I belonged in <laughs> it, it it came so naturally to me I'd been a uh, and growing up I I was too small to play football and I was I was a, a baseball player primarily and in fact I had a tryout for for the for the local uh, uh, you know, we had each each town had a had a city team, and I was on one of the city teams. And I, I was only five one, and I was a little squirt. And uh, but uh, when I got in the navy, why well, I, I found out that the the an airplane made up for a lot of other things, and uh, fly, flying just somehow became very natural to me. And uh, so I got uh, you know the, it's the old story: the rich gets richer. You know, the more the more sh airplanes you get checked out in, the more fair planes suddenly become available to you. So I, I got to do a lot of, of early flying, uh, and, uh, and that's where I got the, I got the first squadron. And they had to have a nickname for everybody, so I was nicknamed Whitey. <laughs> that's where that name came. I need to slide by here for just one second. Well, you can just stay where you are. I think I can get by. Hmm? The, uh, yeah, Whitey, we want to thank you for that. An incredible evening again. Every time you're here, we uh, we learn more about you and, and also about your accomplishments. And uh, this is the Lindbergh lecture, and and there's a significance to this that, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, as to 
the criteria we use for selecting the speakers and the, the, the principles that uh, Lindbergh exhibited in, in terms of the way he flew. The, uh, I never knew that he read the handbook cover to cover before he went, though I always <laughs> thought he was pretty much a start it up and go. But in 2007, in recognition of the 80th anniversary of Charles Lindbergh's historic flight, sculptor Don Wiegand created two bas-relief works of art, the works one of Charles Lindbergh and the other of the Spirit of St. Louis. These were accessioned into our collection here at the uh, Smithsonian, and uh, the Wiegand Foundation is a partner with the Charles A. and Ann Morrow Lindbergh Foundation, and they each year produce these incredibly beautiful uh, medallions of that re replicate the uh, both the Lindbergh and the Spirit of St. Louis uh, sculpture. And they presented us with this, first of all, the, the box is good enough to, to make it worth the whole, but it's a beautiful, um, yeah, I mean, you can see it, but it's oh, a that is yeah, I'll hand it to you. The, um, oh. these are collector's items, and <laughs> <laughs> don't melt it down. <laughs> the, uh, wow, that is but heavy. <laughs> but uh, in that's a special recognition for you, Whitey, as being our Lindbergh lecturer, and we want you to have that as a memento. <laughs> from uh, got Lindbergh on this side. We got Spirit of St. Louis on this side, and this thing is heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and it and there's a lapel pin to go with it, and I've uh, we've already got one on, so I won't pin you because you're wearing your test pilot uh, medallion, but. We want you to have these two, and and we we are grateful to the Lindbergh and the Wiegand Foundation for making these well available. Well, thank you. So we want to thank you. Wear it with pride. We want to once again thank Bombardier for making this evening possible. Thank all of you for coming, and we'll try to keep. Uh, you know, one of the things that this is the hundredth anniversary of Navy aviation, and of course, all the naval naval aviators seem to be no, no, it's naval aviation. What we want to do, the, the Navy Aviation bought its first air airplane in 1911. It was not till 1912 that Cunningham showed up for flight training, so Marine Aviation started in 1912. By celebrating them separately, we get to raise, run the celebration for two years. <laughs> and, and one thing Naval Aviators know how to do is celebrate. So we're gonna keep this thing going, and, uh, but we appreciate we have more lectures uh, for this season with more Navy pilots, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you very much, and please exit through the rear of the theater. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was great. Yeah.